morning, folks. Good to see you this morning. And we're um, continuing on in our study of science and creation. This is the fifth lesson in this series. And we have two, three, four lessons up here. I thought we had number one, but we don't. Uh, we'll have some more number ones uh, next week for those that want any of the back lessons. But we're on number five today with the orange cover. If you need a lesson, hold up your hand and uh, we'll see that you get one. Okay, let's look to God in a word of prayer and if we get into our lesson today. Heavenly Father, as we come now in the name of Jesus, that matchless name, the name that is above every name, the name at the very mention of which every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We come into that name today, Heavenly Father, that name that is so vilified in the world and so hated by so many. And Lord, we just thank you for the love and the grace that sent the Lord Jesus to die on the cross on, in our place. We come in his name, Lord, and ask you to teach us by your Holy Spirit to instruct us from the word and to tie these things together and to see the great creative hand of God, the great power of God at work. And so, Lord, just bless this study time together and the fellowship time in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, as we, um, as we move deeper into the creation series itself, we're, to, we're going to consider a, a third alternative. And that third alternative is something called theistic evolution. Now, if you have not been here before, the three main branches of science are spoken of in the scripture. Anthropology, the study of man, um, geology, the study of the earth, and astronomy, which is the study of the heavens. So we've been dealing the last week or two, we've been dealing with geology, the study of the earth, and the Bible says, speak to the earth and it will teach thee. And so in relationship to that, we have been dealing with the fact that we are living in a young earth, in a young universe. All of the evidence, quite to the contrary of what evolution teaches, all of the evidence is for a young creation and a young earth and a young universe. The evolutionist talks of millions of years, but we as creationists, we don't talk about millions of years, we talk about days. Because if you'll notice Exodus 20 verse 11, right at the top of your first page, in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. What the evolutionist talks about millions of years, and in many cases billions of years, is summed up in the word of God as something that happened in six literal days. So the question always comes up, how long is a day? And when people ask this question, it is, it is really seeded in unbelief. How long is a day? Well, a day is a day. A day is an approximate 24 uh, hour period of time. And um, so how long is a day? Well, those days, I believe those days in Genesis are six literal days. Now, we've talked about creationism. We have that on one extreme, and we've talked about evolution. We have that on the other extreme, but right in between the two, there is a third entity, which is called theistic evolution. And this is kind of like a bone, the devil throwing a bone to some people to, that won't accept out and out evolution. And um, I had my first encounter with theistic evolution in the fifth grade. Our fifth grade social studies teacher, Mrs. Silman was her name. Uh, she had been teaching the class about evolution. And I was fascinated by it. I had been raised in Sunday school. Now the church I was raised in did not preach the gospel, but I'll give them this, they did teach the stories from the Bible, and they did teach that God was the creator. And so I had been taught first by my grandmother, secondly by my mother, and thirdly by my Sunday school teacher that God created everything. And at a, a, a young mind doesn't take it any farther than that. This is what 
This is what uh, I was taught. It was, that teaching was reinforced. And so that's the way it was. And Mrs. Silman, our fifth grade social studies teacher, began teaching us evolution. And this was the first I had ever heard of evolution. And I was fascinated by it. And it's a, it's a fascinating story. The idea of uh, one species evolving into, into another species and so forth. And it never dawned on my young little 10 year old mind that this was conflicting with the word of God. And then one day our, our teacher got up and she said, I want to know how many in class believe in God? And almost every hand went up. And she says, I want to know how many believe that God created everything. And almost every hand in the class went up. And she said, so do I. And she says, when we teach about evolution here in class, we're not teaching something that is contrary to the Bible teaching or what you've learned in church. She says, evolution is just the way God created it. God created everything and he used evolution to do it. Well, I didn't know the term at that time, but the term is theistic evolution. Theistic means God, it comes from the Greek word theos, which means God. And uh, that sounded perfectly logical to me. And so I guess that day in, in um, social studies class, I became a theistic evolutionist. And I think that my, probably for the next 10 years or so, that's probably where I was, uh, was coming from. When you talk about creation, okay, yeah, I believe in creation. Yeah, I believe God did it. How did he do it? Well, he did it by, by evolution. And I, I didn't realize that there was this huge conflict in between. And it wasn't until I got a little bit older and realized there were other things in the world than Tiger baseball, Red Wing hockey, and Lion football and girls that there was anything else worth uh, studying closely. And uh, come to find out, I thought, you know, this is, a, this is a conflict. This conflicts with what the Word of God teaches us. And um, we're going to uh, just talk for just a little bit about this theistic evolution and why it is so terribly, terribly wrong. What the theistic evolutionist tries to do is to reconcile that which is unreconcilable. You can't put the scriptures and the teaching of evolution together and make them fit. It's like square pegs and round holes. It just will not, it will not work. The, um, the theistic evolutionist believes in both theories and tries to fit them together. And when they get all done with it, we have divine creation taking place in a framework of millions of years. And the Bible never teaches that. The Bible says in six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Well, Darwin, the founder of the evolutionary hypothesis, he believed that the earth was about 300 million years old. We talked a little bit about that last week. Now, if the creation week, Genesis chapter one, if the creation week was 300 million years old, then each day, because it's divided up into days, each day would be a period of time consisting of 42.80 million years. Those are pretty long days. And a day is part light and part darkness. And so every single one of those days would be 42.80 million years consisting of 21.4 million years of light and 21.4 million years of darkness. And this is absolutely unconceivable. And nowhere in the Bible does it teach any such thing that these days were long extended geological ages, extended periods of time, a day is a day. And we're going to give you some reasons for believing that that a day in, in Genesis was, a, um, was a, a, a literal 24 hour day. So we have creationism, we have evolution, and now we have this third group, the theistic 
evolutionists, which is nothing more than a compromise. It's uh, maybe a step above or a step below, depending how you look at it, with the, uh, what do they call it now, the intelligent design that they're trying to put across. It's to teach creationism without God. And, uh, you know, call, call it the truth the truth. You know, it is God who created the heavens and the earth. The Genesis one day is a 24 hour period or less. It could be a little bit less because a day is one revolution of the earth spinning on its axis. And I believe back uh, at original creation, the earth was spinning faster than it has. We're gonna talk about that for a little bit next week. But the earth was spinning a little bit faster, might have been a little bit shorter than a 24 hour period. But nonetheless, it would be right in the, in the ballpark. Now, one of the greatest evidences from nature, from creation itself, to show that those days in Genesis were literal 24 hour days would be the study of the yucca, yucca plant and the yucca moth. Now, I don't know if you ever heard about the yucca plants and the yucca moths, but it's an interesting study and it completely blows evolution right out of the water. And um, uh, people ask the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? By the way, a group of scientists just got together just this past week to decide which came first, the chicken or the egg, and they decided that the egg came first. <laughs> they did. This is, this is how out of tune, out of step, out of sync they are. But which came first, the yucca plant or the yucca moth? It's even a harder question for them to, uh, uh, to answer. You see, the yucca plant cannot possibly exist without the yucca moth. And the yucca moth cannot possibly exist without the yucca plant. Here's what happens. The female moth flies to a yucca plant and uh, finds a flower on that yucca plant and she goes down into the flower and collects the pollen out of that, out of that plant. Then she flies to a second yucca plant and she goes to the base of the flower and she pokes a hole in it. And she crawls through that hole and she lays one egg, just one, one egg in the base of that flower. Then she flies out, and goes up into the top of the flower and she's got these special pouches inside her mouth that she has filled with pollen from the first yucca flower. And then she goes and she fertilizes the second yucca plant from the pollen she's carrying in her mouth. And when she does this, that fertilizes the plant and um, causes the plant to produce many seeds. Her moth egg that she laid in the bottom of that flower hatches and the, the one little larva that comes out eats the seed from the yucca plant. Now the yucca plant produces many seeds, but um, most of them are scattered to the winds and produce more plants, but the, um, it, it's pollinated by the moth. They, they, they have no uh, uh, machinery to, to uh, pollinate themselves. And so, um, the yucca plant is totally dependent on the yucca moth to pollinate it. They, they would have died out centuries and centuries ago. And by the same token, the yucca moth is totally dependent on the yucca plant. That's where they are hatched. That's their first food. And so here are two living creatures. One is a plant, one is an insect, and they cannot exist without another. So ask the evolutionists, which came first, the plant or the insect? And the answer is simple if you believe in creationism, because the Bible says in Genesis chapter one, verse 11 and 12, that God created vegetation on the third day. 
And he, we are told in the same chapter, verses 24 and 25, that moths, which come under the category of creeping things, were created on the sixth day. So there were six days apart between from the creation of the yucca plant and the creation of the yucca moth. And um, the one cannot exist without the other. If these days were long extended geological ages, totaling up millions of years or even thousands of years or even hundreds of years. They need sunlight, uh, a plant needs sunlight and uh, to live, uh, it could not possibly have happened. So every time you see a yucca plant or a yucca, yucca moth, it is a testimonial to the fact that God is the God of creation. He has created them and the, this is a young universe in which we in which we lived now the um uh which one came first well the ma the plant did by about three days and that and that's it now in genesis chapter one the creation account in verse three we have day one and the bible says that uh, the earth and the light from the sun are brought into close proximity together and it says the evening and the morning were the first day. And then in verse six through eight, we have God adding the atmosphere to the earth and the firmament, he divides the firmament and the evening and the morning were the second day. And then in verse nine, we have the dry land appears. And after that, then on that same third day, vegetation that comes along and uh, the evening and the morning were the third day and then on uh, in verse 16, we have day four where the, uh, the orbit of the sun and the earth's orbit and the moon's orbit and all of that are all adjusted to the present, to what they are today. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And then in uh, verse 20 and 21, we have the creation of fish and fowl, those uh, animals that live in the air and in the sea. And the Bible says that the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And then on day six, God creates the mammals and finally mankind on day six. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day and God rests on, this, on the um, sixth day. Now, vegetation must have sunlight. And secondly, the days in Genesis all had evenings and mornings. And these Genesis days are all numbered. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're all numbered for it. Now you don't do any of this if, oh, if it's a long time period. Uh, you would not have evening and morning. You would not have the days uh, numbered such as they are. And then in addition to that, um, you would not have uh, the age of Adam given uh, as it is, if you notice in your note sheet, right in the middle of the second page, Genesis 3, 5, I'm sorry, Genesis 5, 3. In Genesis 5, 3, it says, Adam lived 130 years, and he begat a son in his own likeness and after his image, and he called his name Seth. This was at least the third son of Adam. There was Cain and there was Abel. Cain killed Abel and then there was Seth. And, and Genesis 5.3 tells us that when Seth was born, Adam was 130 years old. Now, if there was a long geological age, uh, Adam would have been well beyond that. So how long was Adam in the Garden of Eden before he fell? probably not very long because he didn't have any children until they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And so probably his stay in the Garden of Eden was 100 years or less than 100 years. And so we, th these days in Genesis 1 are not long extended periods of time. Everything, the way the scripture describes them, they all speak of the fact that, that um, they were days as we think of days today. In Genesis chapter two, the first three verses says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished 
and all the host of them. And then it says, notice, on the seventh day. So in those first six days, everything was, was finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. So you have literal days, days of 24 hours or maybe a little less than 24 hours because the rotation of the earth is slowing down a little bit. And um, so you have literal days. They have a morning, they have an evening, they're numbered, they're in order, in chronological order. And God did the whole thing in those six days and then he rested on the seventh day. Vegetation could not live in darkness for millions of years. Totally impossible. And these long periods of time are, are, uh, are, never, are never numbered. So when they, the theistic evolutionist talks about the days being long geological ages, it just is not so. You cannot reconcile that which is unreconcilable. You cannot harmonize that which is discord. You cannot bring these two together. And there is nothing in scripture that even remotely hints at millions of years. No place in the Bible do you find anything that speaks of millions of years. Yet you pick up a newspaper article of the latest find of evolution and so forth, and you read about a skull or a fossil or a bone or a or, or something, and they've always got millions and millions and millions of years connected with it. And I don't know if you've ever noticed or not, but usually in that article, when, whatever it's talking about, it'll always say, this pushes our knowledge of man, or this pushes human history back another few million years. They toss these millions of years around like, like they're just uh, uh, seconds, really. And um, there's no evidence to bear it out. Now, we're going to look at some things today. We're going to look, we have them listed for you there at the bottom of your second page. There are uh, 12 things there. And we're going to look at them, and we're going to look at them as the evolutionist looks at them and see what kind of dates that they come up with. Now go to the next page, and on the next page you have a picture of a clam. And so we're going to see clamming up the, the evolutionist here. They have taken, uh, taken these clams, and they dated them. And they, there are four main, well actually there's more than that, but they used the four of the main dating procedures to determine how old this fossilized clam was. And they, the first one they used was the uranium lead method, and it gave the date at 500 million years, plus or minus 20 million years. So right away we got half a billion with a plus or minus factor of another 20 million. Now they see they're, they're, they talk in millions of years. They say that's the uranium lead method of dating them. But they took the same clam and they used the potassium aragon method and it gave a completely different date of 100 million with a plus minus factor of 2 million. That's quite a bit difference. Then they took the same clam and they used the Reuben idiom, stronium model, I'm probably murdering those words, and using that method it tested 325 million years with a plus minus factor of 25 million years. You know they talk about theologians not agreeing with each other. These scientists and their tests do not agree with each other and they're, they are way, 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 way off from what uh, the others are teaching. And then the fourth um, test was the Rubinium Strodium uh, Isochron test, which gave a totally different date, 375 million with a plus minus factor of 35 million years. Now this is all done on the same clam, fossilized clam. And uh, 
obviously somebody is way, 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 way off. Then on the next page, we have the volcanic eruption that took place in New Zealand. The first lava eruption that was seen by Europeans in New Zealand was in 1870. But then in April and May of 1948, there were several ash eruptions and then finally a, a tremendous blast that came down the north slope in February of 1949. And then there was another eruption that lasted from May the 13th, 1954 to March the 10th, 1955. That was quite a, quite a, a blast. And located on there are the dates of all of these eruptions. Then there was a tremendous explosion in January and another one in March of 1974. But the most violent of all of the eruptions from this volcano was on February the 19th, 1975. So these, these um, eruptions of this volcano are all in recent history and they are all dated for us. People, people that live there know exactly uh, when this happened, they, they, they were all recorded. And so 11 different samples were collected from five recent lava flows in January of 1996. So this is not that far back now. And gives, it, it lists there, we won't read all that, about uh, two each from each, each one of these different lava flows. And the dates obtained are, they range from 0.27 million years to three and a half million years. This is dating this lava rock, which was observed to have cooled between 25 and 50 years ago. So where is this scientific dating coming from? When these people talk about millions of years, where, where are they getting it? all of that from. Uh, we're, not going to, uh, we're not done with this page yet, but on the next page we have a chart of the flow date, the sample, the lab code, and the millions of years that were assigned to each one of them. They ran them all through the lab again. The lab manager uh, did the whole thing all over again, and they got virtually the same results. They observed to, uh, were observed to have uh, had been observed to have formed less than 50 years ago, and yet they were dating them as high as three and a half million years ago. Something is dr drastically wrong with this dating procedure that is the key to teaching evolution. This is the key to the teaching of evolution because remember the, the example of the monkeys with the typewriters, and the evolutionist says, give them enough time and time is the, is the factor here. Give them enough time and they'll produce eventually the Encyclopedia Britannica. Then on March the 19th, 1982, going to the, to the next page, um, here we have um, uh, uh, Mount St. Helens erupted and in a 140 foot deep canyon, which they call the Little Grand Canyon, was formed in one day. 140 foot deep canyon just in one day. Now you compare that to the Grand Canyon and the Grand Canyon could have been formed in 40 days, not the millions of years that the evolutionist uh, talks about. And by the way, there's a book on the market. Um, I forget the name of it now. It's all about the Grand Canyon and it's written from a creationist point of view and how it shows how that canyon uh, was formed very, very quickly. And um, going back to our note sheets here, since the eruption, new rock layered strata, just like the walls of the Grand Canyon, have also continued to form at the rate of 100 feet per year, and in one case, 25 feet in one day. The walls of this canyon there at Mount St. Helens. And it says the walls of the Grand Canyon reach over 6,000 feet above sea level. The Grand Canyon is supposed to have been formed by a river eroding it over millions and millions of years. Well, the point the river enters in is 2,800 feet above sea level, and it supposedly has come from 6,000 feet above sea level. Rivers don't run upstream. 
<laughs> they only run downstream. And so um, uh, they would have had to run uphill over 3,200 feet vertically to form the Grand Canyon. Well, here's an example at Mount St. Helens. This canyon is being formed and they're watching it happening. They're watching it take place. And this brought something else to my mind when one of the spaceships, I forget which one it was, that was mapping out the surface of Mars, they found a huge canyon on Mars which was bigger than the Grand Canyon. And they have said that could not this have been evidence that water must have been on Mars. Well, using the evolutionary theory, yeah, that would have shown millions and millions and millions and millions and maybe billions of years of water running on Mars. But where is it today? There's no, as far as we know, there's no water there. But it could have, that, that huge canyon could have been formed just in a matter of days by the same thing that is forming the canyons here on Earth at Mount St. Helen and the Grand Canyon itself, which is volcanic eruptions. Okay, so um, here we see again uh, what, uh, uh, what, what out of nature is clocked at taking millions of years. We're seeing it, the very same thing happen in a matter of days and in some cases just a few years. Uh, the United States Geological Survey recently published the fact that the scab lands, which were supposed to have been formed over millions of years, they've done a more close study on it. This is our own government. They've done a closer study on it, and they found out that the great scab lands were, were uh, formed in two days. Now, I don't know what method they used to come up with this, but good for them. They said, no, it wasn't millions of years. It was two days to form it. And then they used the radiocarbon-14 dating method, and they took wood from Australia, and they dated it by the carbon-14 method, and the date came up at 45,000 years old. Well, I don't believe that that is correct either, but they took the same piece of wood and they analyzed it by the potassium aragon method, and they came up with 45 million years old. Same piece of wood. So these dating methods do not work. And when a scientist gets up and smugly says that this fossil dates back to two and a half billion years ago, he's just pulling that number right out of the air. Just total fabrication. There is a particular rock from Mount St. Helens volcano that is known to have been formed in 1986. And with the potassium aragon radiometric method, it was determined to be 350,000 years old, give or take 50,000 years. They watched it being formed in 1986. And then Radio uh, carbon analysis of specimens obtained from mummified seals in southern Victoria has yielded ages ranging from 615 to 4,600 4, years. So um, I'm going to talk more about the mummified seals in just a moment here. However, along with that, they took a seal that had been just killed and they sent it for analysis and it was dated at 1,300 years. They had just killed it, and they dated it at 1,300 years. On Hawaii, the uh, basaltic rocks from Hawaii that have been known to be uh, less than 200 years old when dated with the potassium aragon method reveal ages between 160 million years to 300 billion years. So something is drastically, drastically wrong. Dr. Alan Riggs of the U.S. Geological Survey, he said by radiocarbon dating, living snails are 27,000 years old. They're still alive, 27,000 years old. And then, uh, what about Honest Abe Lincoln? Uh, Lincoln was supposed to never tell a lie, 
Well, neither does the monument that is dedicated to Lincoln. If you notice on the next page, underneath the Lincoln Memorial Monument there, there are stalactites forming. And they're 50 inches in length. And stalactite is formed by water running through the ground, picks up minerals, uh, runs, runs down, and then um, uh, evaporates and leaves the minerals behind. And that forms these stalactites. And this is what forms in caves. That's how they date some caves. These caves, oh yeah, these caves are so many millions of years old. If you ever gone to Mammoth Cave, the, uh, the guide there at Mammoth Cave will tell you how many million years old that cave is and how long it took to form that cave and so forth. Well, here's these same stalactites growing underneath the Lincoln Memorial. The Lincoln Memorial wasn't built until 1922. And here we find these stalactites growing at two thirds of an inch per year underneath there. So where are all the millions of years? But speaking of caves and the flow stone, such as the, uh, uh, we talk about the mummified seals and so forth. Here's a picture, it's not a very good picture, but it's a bat covered by flow stone in a cave and he was covered over before he could rot. Now stop and think about it. This is a process that is supposed to take millions of years. But this flow stone, as they call it, the water dripping through the ground, picking up the minerals, depositing them on the bat, then the water evaporates, leaves behind the minerals, and the whole bat is covered with these mineral deposits, this flow stone. And this all happened before the body of the bat could rot. So where's the millions of years here? And then in addition to that, um, um, I, I was in, I believe it was Mammoth Cave quite a few years ago, and they claim that there is an Indian there that is, apparently he was sick or wounded or something, crawled up on a ledge and died. And he is covered with flowstone. That flowstone covered him before his body could rot away, before his flesh could disintegrate. So when they using flowstone and stalactites and so forth to teach millions and millions of years, there is just no basis for it at all. Lava rocks, which were known to have been formed in 1800 and 1801 in Hawaii show an age of 160 million years by the potassium argon method. And um, uh, they know these rocks are less than 200 years old. And on the next page, we have a deliberate hoax. Here is one of these, um, one of these anthropologists that gets, he, he got fired for deliberately falsifying these dates. And he is a, described as a flamboyant anthropology professor who his work has been cited as evidence that the Neanderthal man once lived in Northern Europe. He's been forced to resign by a German university panel. They say he fabricated data and plagiarized the works of his college. His name is Reiner Prosch von Zeiten, a Frankfurt University panel ruled that he lied about the age of human skulls, dating them tens of thousands of years, even though they were much younger. And it goes on and tells it how he's gone on for 30 years, deliberately distorting the dates. And this is just one man. And if they've caught one man, how many others are out there that have not been caught yet? Call, caught yet? And uh, someone called his work 30 years of dating disaster. And uh, he dated a 3,300 year old skeleton as 21,300 years old. He dated that a skeleton of a man, 27,400 years old. And they found out the man died in 1750. And so uh, when they cut the skull open, it still had odor in it, still smelled. Just like that dinosaur thigh bone of the T-Rex, when they, when they broke it open, there's still blood cells and blood vessels inside there. Uh, Obviously, these long, long, long periods of time 
just never, never happened. They did not happen at all. Now, I want to tell you a story. Um, it's a long story, but I've shortened it up quite a bit. And I want to show you some pictures that go along with it. There is a man, there was a man, he's dead now. His name was Waldemar Julesrud. And he was a German uh, hardware store merchant, but he lived in Mexico. So we've entitled this Illegal Aliens. We're going to see some illegal aliens here. Okay. Um, he, was, he lived in an area called uh, Acabaro, Mexico, and right next to it is a slope of a mountain, El Toro, which means the bull. And on July 1944, Waldemar Julesrud was riding his horse, and the sunlight picked up something shiny in the slope of this, uh, of this mountain, El Toro. And so he went and he began to scrounge around there and he pulled out a piece of ceramic pottery. And he dug around a little more and he, and he found some more. And so he wondered what in the world could, could all of this possibly be. And so he, um, uh, let me get my pages together here. Uh, he, he, dug, he dug farther and he, he found there was, there was more of it buried in there. And so um, he went and he hired a Mexican farmer. And this Mexican farmer's name was Odilon Tinajero. And he hired him to dig in the base of this mountain here to find some more of these ceramic figures. And so the man did. And he brought him a wheelbarrow full of them. And uh, the um, uh, uh, Jules Rudd was so excited about it, he said, forget your farm. He says, I'll pay you one peso, which at that time was worth about 12 cents in American money. He says, I'll pay you one peso for every one of these ceramic figures that you dig, dig out here. So the man went and he produced them. He, at one point they had 33,500 of these little figurines that they dug out of the mountain, out of the mountainside. And um, um, they, they, it turned out that they were sculptures in ceramic and carvings out of stone. And they were in various colors. And there was people of, depicting people that were Eskimos. Now, how did somebody in Mexico know about Eskimos? And Asians and Africans, and Caucasians with beards, and Mongols, and Polynesians, as well as objects that had cultural connections with Egypt and the Sumerians. Now, in addition to all of that, and this is why we're telling the story, they found many of these little ceramic statues and carvings of dinosaurs. Now, here's a picture of them, some of them, a few of them. These are all either stone or ceramic. And they were dug out of this mountain base there in this little town in Mexico, okay? And um, uh, we've got more to show you, but we'll wait for, uh, for, just, for just a moment. So somebody had made those. And as they examined them, they found they were not made out of a mold. Each one was individually sculptured or carved, and there was no two that were alike. And initially they found over 20,000 of them. It turned out to be way more than that. But this is, uh, they, they could not find a duplicate out of the, tw of the first 20,000 that they, that they dug up. And, um, they, they, they numbered several hundred of just dinosaurs alone. And um, it's interesting because in 1955, which was 11 years later, um, the, uh, in, in, uh, the American dinosaur, Brachiosaurus, was found. Now, up until 1955, 
Nobody knew anything about a Brachtosaurus, but one of these figurines is that of a Brachtosaurus, and he's in a fighting pose here, as he's up on his two hind legs, using his tail as a balance there. And so, um, if this was a hoax that was put there uh, whenever, uh, nobody even knew about this particular type of a dinosaur that existed. And then 33,500 figurines, including musical instruments, masks, idols, tools, utensils, statues, human faces of many different nationalities, and dinosaurs were dug out of, out of this uh, mountainside, and including, and in Guad, I don't know if this is pronouncing it right, in Guadadun dinosaur figurine. Now back there in the 40s and 50s, this, also, this type of dinosaur was also completely unknown. I don't know if that one did or not, or if it's the next one. I think it might be the next one. Um, yeah, it's the next one here. This, this particular type of dinosaur was completely unknown. This is a drawing of an uh, artist's conception of it, but here is the little figurine. Another, t so this is two, two types of dinosaurs that were completely unknown at that time that they were discovered, and it was in the 70s, 1970s, late 70s, that skeletons of these particular dinosaurs were found w w with nests and and babies and so forth. And so Mr. Jules Rudd tried to gain the attention of the scientific community, but was met with indifference and academic silence. These anthropologists and scientists would not come near him or his discoveries because these were obviously man-made objects. And here you've got all the different races of people, as well as inventions like musical instruments and so forth, and a whole variety of dinosaurs. And they were, had to all have been made pretty much during the same time period by pretty much the same, uh, same kind of people for whatever, uh, whatever reason it was. He was just ignored. They would not come and examine them at all. However, news of it began to leak out, and as news of it leak out, um, uh, they began some other excavations in the nearby area, and more dinosaurs were uncovered, and um, uh, some of them were found in roots of trees under the ground. And um, the, as it says here in the story, the establishment scientists continued to act as if nothing significance of significance had happened at M. Cabarro. They would threaten, that would threaten the evolutionary paradigm. And um, freshly dug pits produced objects with roots entwining them, which means they had to have been there for a long, long time. And it goes on and says that um, uh, tree roots at a depth of five to six feet, is where they found some of them, tree roots were all entwined around them at, at five and six feet deep. This was, a, if somebody's trying to create a hoax here, they went to an awful, awful lot of time and work and money. Samples were sent away to laboratories to date these things. And of course, you might guess what's gonna happen here when they, they sent the dates back. They sent one human, figurine and one dinosaur figurine to this laboratory. And they dated the human figurine at 4,000 years old and the dinosaur figurine at 1,500 years old. And so they said that somebody must have known about dinosaurs and had made these, these figurines. Well, Mr. Jules Rudd was a wealthy man. He lived in a 12-room mansion and he started collecting these things. And he, um, he got so many of them that he had them all over his house, including his bedroom. He was actually sleeping in his bathtub because he had these figurines all over the place. And he's begging scientists to come 
and examine them and date them and so forth. They would have nothing to do with it. Finally, they did send a panel of scientists that poo-pooed the whole thing. They said they were a hoax. They had been planted there. Well, uh, at this t by this time, some Christians had uh, gotten involved in this. And they said, well, if these figurines are buried underground all over the place, maybe they're under some houses too. And so the chief of police of that town volunteered his house. The houses there have concrete floors. And the chief of police house was built in 1930. And that was 25 years before Mr. Jules Rudd even came to Mexico. And so they chopped a hole, six foot, six foot square, in the floor of the chief of police house. And then they began to dig and they dug down six feet under his house. And they brought up all kinds of figurines of dinosaurs along with all the, all the other things. And so um, uh, they dug the six foot deep uh, pit. And the house had been built 25 years before Mr. Jules Rudd arrived in Mexico, so he was exonerated, but still these evolutionary scientists would not admit that these were genuine and they said it had to be a hoax. Well, these figurines were sent out to various laboratories for the dating method. And um, uh, 1640 BC, 4530 BC and 1110 BC were some of the dates that they came back with. So they're not all that old. This was used in the carbon 14 dating method, which is not accurate, but is far more accurate than any of this uh, uh, other, uh, other types of, of dating that they, have, uh, that they have come up with. Well, um, an independent C14 um, carbon dating uh, said that the human figure was, um, this is of the two samples, the human figure was 4,000 years old and the dinosaur was 1,500 years old. Very, very interesting. And so this um, uh, Mexican farmer, uh, he, he thought he was getting rich. He's, for uh, 12 cents a figurine, he's digging them out. And there's, they are in the thousands. Many of them, in fact, thousands of them, have mysteriously disappeared. But there are still plenty of them there. They all look different. There's no two that are alike. Somebody made them. We have no idea who. Mr. Jules Rudd was also an amateur archeologist. And he had studied Indian civilizations that had lived in Mexico way back then. And he had, um, uh, he had no knowledge of what this could possibly have been. So uh, we're, how, who made them? We don't know. But it's obviously is evidence, overwhelming evidence, that this earth is not anywhere near as old as the evolutionist wants us to believe. And that these, these um, dinosaurs must have been contemporary with human beings at that point. What other explanation could possibly be given? Now, we do have some lessons on dinosaurs coming up. This is not one of them, but this is just an example of the dating frauds and the dating uh, errors that take place to prove the millions of years theory that is nowhere taught in the Word of God. Now, let's look to God in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Dismiss us now, our Heavenly Father. May your blessing rest upon us. May Christ be glorified in all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.